All right, next question. Aries HP asks, I would like to know your opinions on cardio as a tool to boost your endurance in lifting. Sprints, walking or jogging, what do you think works best to eat the 20 rep squat? It depends on the duration of a 20 rep squat, easily two minutes, I guess. So sprints that are basically around two minutes. If you want, if you're just wanting to get better at high, high rep sets, jogging is not going to work. Walking, same, because it's way too low into intensity. Sprints will be much better. The systemic effect is pretty similar, so I'd say sprints. But you cannot do a 10 second sprint. You'll have to basically run fast for about two minutes, a little more or a little less. So you are into the realm of training for like 500 meters to even one, one kilometer run. Croissant hyper croissant trophy. Ask, uh, what is the optimal weekly croissant intake for muscle growth? I'm not going to answer that because it's a secret and if I say this, everyone will be jacked. And I want to hoard the uh, knowledge for me and only for me. And you apparently know it yourself too, so uh, I don't know, you tell me. Uh, Napoleon Ni, with a very nice John Cena avatar. Ask, thought on a few long sessions per week, like three full body sessions per week, versus something like an Arnold Split where you go six days per week but have shorter sessions. Volume equal, three full body sessions a week. When you're training, you're not just training onto your muscle, you're not just uh, impacting muscle, tendons, nerve, you're also impacting the endocrine system, your hormones. And the next day, if you retrain, you're just picking back up to basically where you left in terms of hormones and in terms of recovery uh, when you stop the day before. So if you train every day, even if the volume is not superior to the full body, the cycle inside your own body would not necessarily be as keen as to this high frequency. So it depends. Some people withstand much better this kind of hand split than full body. But in my personal opinion on me and many people I trained and train, it's better to do three to four sessions a week and then you let your body rest. You let it be, okay? You let the cortisol go down, you let the prolactin go down, you let the testosterone do its little thingy thing, you know, getting high, getting low, getting high, getting low, and then you do what you want with that. But I've done both, both works, okay? It's just the sustainability is definitely not the same, okay? All right, next question, David de Gallic ask, question for the q and I would love to hear your approach to exercise rotation. I tend, I tend to not rotate some exercise at all and over variation of the main movement pattern too often. I'm kind of lost on when the right time is to rotate to get the most gains and avoid over injuries. Plateauing for a few weeks on an exercise is normal if everything else is going up by plus one. But I tend to rotate it directly instead of grinding for it. Would love to get some guidance. Been training five years now, so I'm stage where rotation is important. Side note, you're coming off as a very down-to-earth genuine guy. You deserve the success you're about to receive in the, new, in the next few months and years. Keep going, brother. Thank you so much, David. All right, so... The rotation thing is, is pretty simple. You're doing something, and if this something is seriously slowing down, or plateauing, or is starting to hurt you, and by hurting you I mean like a tendon insertion, uh, even right, right in the heart, in the middle of a tendon, or you feel like you're just burnt out, you know, like you're, there is this week you, do, you have this performance, okay, and then the next week you can't even do, redo the same, then the third week you kind of have the same, then fourth week you're done, and this, there is this kind of yo-yo thing going, you know you're plateauing. And most guys have that, for example, on the bench press, because they are just attaching themselves too much to the exercise, they are doing all the time, they are maxing out all the time, and they are just burnt out, okay? The nerves are saying to a few, and they do not want to do that anymore, okay? So are blocking the thing. That's a good moment to uh, rotate the variation. So if you're doing normal bench press, then going to a wide grip bench press or a close grip bench press or bend bench press, both reverse or normal bend, or posed bench press or uh, over variation, you know, um, polo press, Larson press, the other one with legs up, uh, Willy, William press, I don't remember. But basically switching variation to have the same exercise but not exactly the same. So you are training the same muscle, you are training the same molo pattern, but there is that ever so slight difference so you can just go back up. And that's basically uh, what the rotation is about. And on a high isolation exercise, let's just say preacher curl, for example, it could be to uh, switch the uh, angle. Like, uh, imagine your preacher bench is at 45, well, you switch at 60, or you switch at 75, or even like full vertical. Uh, you're doing it with supination, 
when you do supination but with a fat grip. So all of a sudden your, your hand is not like that anymore, it's like that. It changes stuff. It, it's, so, it's so little, but it changes stuff. Especially, as you said, after five years, these kind of things are pretty important. We'd also go to neutral grip. Neutral grip with fat grip. Uh, you're doing with dumbbell, uh, maybe you go with a barbell. Straight barbell, uh, but not going all the way down with a straight barbell, you know. Or easy bar, and when with the easy bar you're really having a pretty close grip, like shoulder width grip, and you go extra, extra low, and you do not come up as high, because you would hit your nose, you know, with a curling of a bar. So it's the same movement, but there are some stuff with a range of motion, the angle of the elbow, the uh, rotation of the shoulder, internal, external, the position of your wrist that are changing, but it's the same movement, and you can just keep progressing that way. When are you doing that? Again, when you're plateauing or when something feels off. Uh, and good luck to you. All right, Nico Shreds ask, q and I have shoulder pain in the left shoulder that hurts on pulling movement, mainly on pull down and pushes, depending on variation and angle. Not so bad on lateral raises, but can definitely feel it fucking faster than the right shoulder. Both elbow after and pain as well. Would you recommend to work around and help it to heal quicker? I've been doing physio and back it off a lot after training, but it's take it's taking a long time. Wonder based on your experience while with injuries, if you ever found anything useful in healing. <sighs> you need to you need to check your AC joint. You need to check uh, your acromio. Is it crooky or is it straight or is it even like pretty short? Because there is maybe a way because you're you're basically hurting when your arm is like that, right? In that position, if you have any kind of thing going on with the AC joint, you're pinching tendons over there. And you said pull down and pushes, depending on variation and angle. So yeah, I think there is something off with your AC joint. You're not feeling so bad on lateral raises, but you can feel something is up. So that means that when you're doing that, you're still pinching a bit, but it's like, it's, it's fine because you're not all the way up there, you know? Uh, and the physio training stuff, there is tendon pain if we elbow. Uh, I'm pretty sure you need to check your cervical because there may be some stuff with the nerve. Uh, but the AC is most likely going to pinch on stuff there, and of course you need to have some weird thing going over there. So um, I'd say to only do presses that do, that do not hurt or are barely discomfortable. I would say to do only neutral grip, like even with dumbbell, you know, you go like that, you just do that with flat bench or it's like a decline, slightly inclined. Same thing with uh, back, forget about pull down, just do rows pre with natural grip. Natural raises you could try with uh, bending over and having uh, natural grip as well to, uh, to allow with much more room into the socket to avoid pinching something, you know. So basically, instead of being like that, you know, you go like this slightly and you have your hand like that and you go here, you know. Same thing with reverse spec deck, instead of being in pronation and pretty high like that, you go quite low and with 45 degree angle with a elbow, you know, like, that, like this, it technically on the paper should be better, all right? But uh, I mean, it's, you, you just write a comment, bro. I, I have no other information, no pictures, no nothing. So, you know, I'm doing my best, but your, your best bet would be to check your cervical spine and to make sure that there is no inflammation. And if your um, acromial bone is crooked, uh, I do not think, I mean, it's genetic, basically. I'm not going to say you're doomed, but you'll have to do without all this very big motion like that. Uh, or you'll have to go through surgery, like maybe they will peel off a bit, you know, to avoid being too, uh, like compressing stuff inside, pinching stuff. Uh, and that's about it, really. Good luck. All right, Dark Knight. Anyone has tip on how to strengthen the wrist? I have naturally small wrists. I don't really care about getting them bigger. If they grow good, if not, also okay, but I need them to be stronger because they hinder me doing pronation work with heavier weights and also with some of my other forearm isolation. Thanks in advance. Uh, I have small wrists too as well when I started training. Basically, I could do that when I was grabbing my, my wrist before. And now, you know, I can barely, it takes a little more effort to touch my finger. When I started, there would be 15 centimeter, five inches something, you know. And right now, they are uh, seven inches. Uh, what did I do? I did a lot of heavy dips, I did a lot of heavy everything, uh, and it's the forearm isolation, especially the wrist curl, that helped with that. Um, they hinder you with pronation work, with heavy weights, so I'm pretty sure you're meaning like barbell work on the presses. I would say to get yourself used to this uh, work, uh, for example, working with single, double and triple, with like a kind of strength-based movement, and also having a proper position, because if you have small wrist and you're saying, oh yeah, pronation work is hard on me because uh, it's too heavy. Yes, probably, but uh, if your position is like that, of course it's going to hurt even me with my thicker elbow. 
you have to be like that when you're doing a pronation work. Even even if it's files grip, it's slightly off like that. You see, I mean files grip or suicide grip if you want, but it's not like that. Here, everyone is going to hurt. It's right there. And if you're grabbing the barbell, you're basically here. So bend can also work, uh, can also work because they're going to compress and help you having much more stability inside, which is something that the wrist is lacking. It has a lot of mobility, but not a lot, a lot, a lot, not a lot of stability. And I would say to work on your dips, your push-ups, heavy hammer curl, stuff like that, and also to isolate uh, both, you know, like every direction, you know, and especially start with wrist curl. This is like the go-to. You cannot go wrong, basically, uh, and use fat grips to be like pretty uh, comfortable with your hand like that, and you just go like this. You know, you can just hold. You know, you do like that, and just you just hold. There will be a lot of pressure around here. Your wrist flexor are going to get thicker and stronger, but also all the little bones and tendon and support structure right there. And uh, yeah, you'll have to be patient because we are talking about bones and tendon. They they grow like nine to 11 times slower than muscle. So we are talking about doing something that will work you at least for a year if you really want to focus on it, okay? Good luck. All right, where, ask. All right, question, as a coach, a big part of your job is noticing the mistake the trainees themselves are blind for. Everyone has a blind spot, blind spot for themselves to some extent. What are some typical blind spots that you have encountered repeatedly over the years with clients so things they theoretically know, but fuck up in application. I appreciate you greatly. Cheers, Michael. Thanks, mate. Mm, I'd say they, I'd say the form degradation. Like they're doing a set and the form start to break down and they keep going. And they do not realize how ugly it is starting to get. And so how dangerous it is. Because most of them are not doing, of course, the prep work for the joint to make sure that even it is in this bad position, there is still some tolerance to it. So yeah, that's the biggest thing. Not realizing, not having the proprioception to realize how bad these are positioned. And also sometimes how, how they're cheating and they do not even realize it. Like doing a dive bomb squat, bouncing the barbell off the chest when they're doing like incline or bench press, stuff like that. Or like they're doing some pull up or dips and they're offsetting, you know, front shoulder, like they're like that, you know. Some of them do not realize that they are not doing a movement correctly. That's really the biggest thing. Not knowing when to stop, not realizing they are not really necessarily good form, or even totally being offset with their form. Okay, Dark Knight asks, a question I have is, do you think that the body fat distribution of a person can change after starting to lift? Same question for body fat set point range. For example, a guy like Bald Omni Man who used to be overweight as a kid and now can stay lean easily around 15% or under, while bulking and probably even lower if he wanted. You just answered your question. Obviously, yes, it's possible. The body fat set point range is determined by genes, all right? And there is something very, very interesting, which is called the epigenetic, which is gene expression. So you have your gene pool, you have all your gene lists, okay? And then depending on how you live, what's the context of your life, you know, some of them will express themselves, some of them will be inhibited. If you're only eating junk food, not moving, and you're like in a cold country, you're not going to have the same life and gene expression that if you're training eating clean, uh, having a physical job, and living in a hot country. It's really not the same. So yeah, obviously it can change. And as for the fat, body fat distribution, it is heavily correlated to the hormone. It's not for nothing that the men are often stocking uh, everything around the, the waist, while women are stocking like um, more spread around the, the legs, the glutes. Uh, there is also the, the breast, of course, like the back of the um, of the, of the arm, it's, it's not the same. Your training, your life context, your genetic, all of that has a, and even your age, all of that has an influence on that. So yeah, everything can change really. Uh, 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 someone who is extremely obese can be pretty shredded later on. I have a friend like that. Someone who, has, who was pretty lean as a kid can become a fatty as an adult, it happens. And as for the uh, body fat distribution, someone like me, for example, I did many, 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 many years of uh, combat sport and there was a continuous amount of work on the abs plus me doing ab work I stock very very I store sorry very very hardly on my stomach while I will stock pretty easily compared to my stomach on the quads you know and I'm a man would say what, what do you mean uh, on the quads you know the, that's, that's the type that's for the ladies right um, but I store way easier on the quads than on the glutes than on the stomach but when I'm leaning out the stomach gets sh basically shredded pretty fast while the quads get right after, and like my stubborn area, like the last one, when I'm very, very, very low, you would, you would think something like the adductors and the glutes, 
you know, the glutes are fine. They all have striation pretty, f pretty fast on the, on, the, on the glutes. It's actually the hamstring. It's the hamstring in like that teeny, tiny spot right there. Like, not the oblique, kind of behind, you know. These are the last uh, area for me that have like this stubborn fat that are, uh, or at least this fatty, like blurred look that I really struggle to, to, get, to get off. Hope that answers your question. John, John, I've noticed your form is quite loose. This goes against the general consensus for hypertrophy. What are thoughts on how this has worked for you and maybe for others to try? Thanks, bro. Okay, well, my form is not loose. You can say it's pretty tonic or explosive, but it's not loose. I'm definitely not loose on the weight. And it does not go against the general consensus for hypertrophy. Because if you have read studies and not just followed con artists and guys that look like they know about science but really are just reading the abstract and don't know anything about it, you would know that the concentric, an explosive concentric, is pretty anabolic. It's the most anabolic, actually, style of rep compared to a slow concentric. It, whatever, if it's purposely slowed or if it's just slow by nature. And as for my form with loose, I'm not loose, I'm pretty tight under the weight. It's just that I'm using my muscle as they have been intended to be used. So basically as rubber band and strings. They can accumulate energy and I will use it. If you look at the biggest and best athlete in bodybuilding, they, they do not train like extra, extra slow uh, and control and blah, blah, blah. Look at Ronnie Coleman. Look at how he trained. And do not tell me, yeah, but he's back. He, he, got he, he got butchered by the doctor. That's not his fault. And do not talk to me about his hip. Every guy in his family at 40 had fucked up hips. Look at his upper body. Look at his shoulder and elbow. How many surgery did he have for his shoulder and elbow? You know, look at how he trained them. Look at Brent Schwarwin. Look at Serge Nubret. Look at uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Look at Lee Priest. Look at uh, Robbie Robinson. All of these guys. The form was not slow and controlled. Definitely not. And yet they are champ. Are they champ despite their form? Or there is something going on with the form itself? You know? But uh, slowing down purposefully your lift, except if you have an injury, except if you have a, a problem, or except if you have a issue with recruiting a certain muscle, it does not serve anything at all. And slowing down the eccentric, again, it depends. Are you slowing down the eccentric for real? Because you want to accumulate muscle damage, but, damage, but then you have to understand that muscle damage uh, can turn off protein synthesis and is extremely hard to recover from, so you trump your uh, frequency uh, and your volume work if you do that. Uh, or are you doing that because you have a problem with the mind-muscle connection? That's not the same, you see? Or are you slowing down a bit the eccentric because you're doing isolation work and you are using quite heavy weight and you just do not want to snap, to snap yourself? And then slowing down the eccentric in that context is not actually uh, the general consensus for hypertrophy, it's just being smart. But I'm <laughs> my form is not loose. I'm not loose under weight. I'm not, like, if I'm doing overweight press, I'm tight and I'm getting it down and then I'm pushing back up as fast as I can, but I'm not loose, you know, the barbell is not bouncing on me, I'm not like catching it when it's going, going down, and same for a squat, I'm not diving, dive bombing when I'm doing a squat, I'm stacked under the weight, I go down, I go up, and I do this as powerfully as possible, because power is force by speed, so yeah, training variable is something I will talk about, because either some guys are messing you up in your understanding of that, despite the fact it's pretty simple at the, at the, at the start, or there is just not one guy who is saying the same thing and there is too much information basically. So I'll, I, I guess I'll uh, talk about that. All right, Alex asks, ask, favorite French bakery item or top three if difficult to choose? Oof. Ay, ay. Damn, this question, bro. Uh... Okay, first thing first, baguette. He said bakery. He did not set pastry. So let's let's start, you know, and be serious. Two seconds. Baguette. Then I would say pain au chocolat. Yeah, pain au chocolat. You know. Because croissant, eh, croissant is just like it's like it's sugar and butter, you know. Pain au chocolat, you know. Chocolate, it's hot, you know, very nice. And I would uh, I would uh, add Bakery. Bakery. I would say crepe. Crepe Breton. 
from from Bretagne, no way, like west west side of France, you no, know, Normandy. It's more often a Bretagne. Yeah, baguette, pain, chocolat, crêpe. Très 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 bien, très très le très le bon, bon appétit, miam miam. All right. So now, ask question for the Q&A. Does breaking the concentric and eccentric chain in an exercise, for example, pin, bench, box squat, diminish hypertrophy gains? I think I've heard this somewhere, but I do not know how that would be the case as long as you control eccentric. All right, yes, it diminishes hypertrophy gains because hypertrophy mostly happens when you are in a lengthened position with your muscle and you have to overcome the eccentric and go back up. A good example for that is RDL, Roman and deadlift. You go down, 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 down. You happen to be in a very flexed position for your hip, so your hamstring are stretched, your glutes are stretched, you're in a precarious position, and you have to go down, stop, and go back up. There is no touch and go, there is nothing to uh, help you at the bottom. Hence why RDL is one of the top best exercises for posterior chain mass. You have this overcome, overcoming eccentric thing happening. Another exercise with good with that would be uh, the incline curl for biceps. You kind of have the same thing with the preacher bench, with the preacher curl, sorry, but it's really much more noticeable on the incline. Uh, another one with the dips, same thing. You, you cannot bounce like on a bench press with a barbell on your chest you, or like force yourself, reflect down or anything. You go down, you have to go up. And the, the string that stop you from here and then revert the motion back up is your chest. You know, nothing else. So that's why, compared to this exercise, if you break the concentric and eccentric chain uh, and you do like bench press uh, like in a rack with pins or same thing with box squat, it's kind of not the same for hypertrophy. Now the best would be to do the, the both, you know? And also it's much easier to train explosivity on this exercise than, the, on, than on the others, because the coordination on this exercise is much easier to achieve than on the other. You can kind of rest by breaking the concentric eccentric chain. And also it's much safer on the joint, especially when you are or, uh, injured or you do not want to get injured. So then you would ask yourself maybe, well, why are bodybuilders not doing that? Some of them are actually. If you do remember Dan Blewett, uh, or John Blewett, I'm not sure of his name, his pseudo is hypertrophy coach on Instagram. Uh, he does love his seated press from pine. So he's like that, with barbell, goes on the pine, press, stop, press, stop. I personally never liked it, but he, do, he, he does love it, and I'm pretty sure he trained with pretty big guys like Ian Valier and Chris Bumstead, so, and that's from a box squat. Yeah, hypertrophy-wise, uh, even if you can lower the box, play with stuff and everything, it's pretty like poor lifting concentric, right? You know, with the explosive enough to get out of the hole. But I've done box squat for years because they were, they were the only viable option for me with my knee issues, and I went up to uh, a one rep max of uh, four plate and a half at like a parallel box and I could rep out the four plates and when I get I got back to squat uh, I could still do ATG two plate after my knee surgery and everything and I'm pretty sure that the box squat helped a ton you know still getting the groove still uh, being used to that you know having a barbell squashing you on your, on your back and so on and so forth uh, so yeah I'd, I'd say it depends you know if you're strictly about bodybuilding you do not need that if you have to be training for a sport, they are a great option. And if you're a powerlifter, you should definitely implement them, you know. Because it's basically the same principle as deadlift. You know, you are down, the barbell is down on the floor, and you have inertia, you have no help, you know. And then you have to reset each time you are touching the floor, or it's touch and go, which is not the same. So yeah, there you go. Uh, Joachim is asking, question for Q&A. What kind of progression for weight and reps do you recommend for intermediate and advanced lifter? I assume linear progression, always add more weight than last week's question, is best for novice. But when that stops working, how are you made sure to progressively increase the resistance? And lololol answered, honestly, double progression or dynamic double progression will get you far for most lift even when you are advanced. For if you compound a power lifter, linear periodization using RPE can mitigate fatigue, but not really necessarily. For isolation, that have been stagnating, the intensity technique like drop set or cross set can help break through a wall. I agree. You basically answered for me. Uh, thank you, Lolololol. Lol. <laughs> uh, but yeah, double progression, basically. As an advance, you just want to keep progressing where you can. So it's either going to be the form or the rep or the weight. And most of the time, it's going to be form and reps and then the weight. And as for the intensification technique with like drop set and cluster set, it's he's right because for isolation you can just you cannot just pound away. Most of the time, the tendon is going to give out way sooner than the muscle. 
So uh, actually implementing these cluster, cluster sets or response set or drop set, uh, you will accumulate much more volume with the same weight on a given exercise. So you will get used to do much more work with a certain rep range and weight. So the moment you up the weight, it's kind of you, it's kind of you already have some kind of work capacity from previously, so you can withstand it better, okay? Uh, and it can also be a, a an intermediate uh, level of progression in between two normal double progression. Uh, if, for example, you have a key joint, like a knee or a elbow. This gives you a little more room to get used to that before going up again, you know? So, yeah, as, as I said, Lolololol basically answered for me, so thank you. Akashi Cheat, uh, I have a question. I was wondering if removing flat bench with an incline would be better because I've seen some studies that show that the incline grew the middle chest just as normal bench plus doing more for the upper chest. But if that's the case, what's the reason for doing flat bench? Also, better gain, shoulder gains too. The only thing I can think about is that A, it's not true at all, or B, because most people can lift more on flat bench so more load and therefore better for hypertrophy. And is there something as having too much upper chest? I know that, can, yeah, that you can have underdeveloped upper chest and it look weird for, from an, an, an aesthetic point of view. Keep up the good content. All right, so very interesting question. Okay, so these studies, uh, we must have not seen the same study because of what I've seen is that uh, both incline and flat bench work the same amount the upper chest. The difference is that flat bench will work much more the lower chest than incline. So then it depends on you actually. Can you make better gains and do you prefer for your problematic and your goals incline press to flat press? Because yes, flat press is easier to go easier and it's also better exercise for chest. If I tell you to flex your chest, are you going to do that? You know, like that. No, you're going to do that here. So this is basically flat bench or decline bench. However, if I tell you try to only squeeze your upper chest, you're going to be like that, you know, here, here. So that's, that's incline, right? Uh, and there is much more uh, uh, capacity for your body to use your delt on the incline than on the flat, strictly speaking. Again, you can always bias, set up yourself, whatever. But yeah, it, it really just depends. So is there something as having too much upper chest? I honestly do not think so, because even if you have a pretty vertical sternum angle and pretty forward clavicle, such as like, for example, Froco Columbu, what happens is that you look, it looks like you have four chest, you know, like not two, like you have a split chest, right? But even, even there, it does not look like there is too much upper chest. It's just really impressive, right? But underdeveloped chest, uh, upper chest, like with a saggy look, yeah, definitely something that we see often. So I'd say that when you're natural, there is not such a thing as too much upper chest. I mean, this is the kind of area where you cannot have too much muscle. It's just like with the traps, the neck, the shoulder. You know, you, you, can, you cannot have too much over there, right? Uh, you can have too much chest. You can have too much legs. You can have too much... Um, too much arms, you know, it can, there is a weird look going on with some muscle. Having a huge yoke, basically, having too much upper chest, yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And uh, yeah, incline, as I said, incline for upper chest is the same as flat, just that the incline does not work much, if at all, the lower chest, while flat does. That's it. That's the real big difference. All right, uh, your sake ask. Looking huge, brother. Thanks. For the q and I was wondering if you have any tips regarding how to plan progression on movement like lateral raises where the weight increase in most gym, cable or dumbbell are pretty big for those movements. I could, for example, perform 20 to 25 reps at a certain weight and barely see 5 to 6 reps on the next weight increase, which can typically be below the lowest threshold in the rep range chosen. Thank you for all your work. Akashi said, I had the same problems and I remember dumbbell on the cable version, I can just place a small weight let's say 1.25 or 2.5 plate in a stack and it works pretty good. And Iago said when you add 2.5 kilo, you lose 20 reps. That's not normal. That's exactly what I was going to say. Something must be off with your form or how you perceive the thing. And regardless, if you go from 20 to 25 reps to 5 to 6, why not work then with a 5 to 7 rep range? You know, with kind of maybe loose form and then this loose, this loose form can go to 8 to 10 and then you, go, you get stricter, so you, go, you will drop back down to 6 to 8, but then you will go back up progressively. But um, as Akashi said also, if you're on the cable, you can just add a little, little something, you know, simply. But something is wrong with your setup and your form. That's, that's not normal to just have a little weight increase and losing 20 reps. So, I'm sorry, bro, something is off. All right, Blade Strike asks, even geography is not same for mobbing. <laughs> Question for... Q&A. In your last full body video, you were doing wrist pronated towel curl to help alleviate wrist discomfort you have been having. 
did help, yes. I've started having pain moving to a gym that has easy bar with a less pronounced bend, tried to pour on with the usual weight, move ego, but started to get more and more discomfort. Now I got this pain in the right arm every time I pronate to the max, even outside the gym, like turning a doorknob. Doesn't affect pressing or non spinated dumbbell curl, close grip, easy bar curl, but I got to find a way to fix it. Bend finger extension have not worked. Okay, so just like one of the first questions I said, there is something going on with your spination and or most likely for you this, this time valgus. If you go to a, to a gym and the easy bar is like that and you're like, oh, I'm fine. And then you go to land with slightly less tilt and you have pain, my brother, you have a valgus. So I would say only dumbbell or unilateral work on the cable. And I would say to work onto your spination. And you say that it's hurting when you're doing pronation to the max. I guess it'd be hurting right there, I think, or it's pulling around here, okay? So you either uh, strain some stuff and have muscle knot on this side, or you have uh, hulna inflammation. I think both are possible, and just switching to dumbbell, you know, like hammer curl, like halter neck curl where you spin at each time like that, uh, it will help you tremendously. Maybe use uh, straps to not um, squeeze too much your hand also, that could help. And uh, yeah, forget about this easy bar. I have the same issue uh, when I have the, like this very bent easy bar. Oh, it's so nice, I can go extra hard and can curl really heavy, you know. The moment I go with straight bar or like slightly bent, my left, my left wrist like says, uh, fuck you, basically, so yeah. Uh, good luck and do that do these things you know like like this like this like this it will help Josepe ask question can someone get an optimal upper body with adjustable dumbbells that go up to some 120 pounds a heavy weight vest and ring pull-ups bar or does someone need machine and barbell as well to maximize upper body gains Jeff answered I think it would be a very good upper body as long as that loading keep you up in the 5 to 30 rep range uh, you will probably get enough mechanical tension and great hypertrophy unless you are so strong 100 pound, 120 pounds is too light and you need more weight. If I were to start a home drill, I'd probably start with an adjustable 120 pound dumbbell and an adjustable bench, great for the cost. It basically answered. Oh, I love this community, it's so, so amazing. I, I do not see what would be lacking, you know. 120 pounds, I, I'd still be working with that too, right now. Heavyweight vest for ring and pull-up bar, perfect. I would say just to get a, a deep station or bar for dips, yeah, that's it. Because even for back, you know, you can do the ring stuff, you can do pull-ups, you can do the dumbbell roll, you can do chest supported roll. No, you're good, bro. You're good. And even if you want to, to work the lower body, you know, like Bulgarian split squat, and you have one dumbbell of 1,200 pounds in each hand, <laughs> you have time, don't worry. 